Yeah, thanks, Frederick. Uh, good morning, everybody. Um, this is the outline of my presentation. I will uh, give a brief um, introduction why to do neuroimaging in, in dementia. I will focus on imaging protocols, in particularly, particularly on MR, but also on CT. Um, then I will focus on the image analysis, how to rate these um, images from um, uh, dementia patients, and then I will focus on imaging pattern, pattern in memory clinic patients, and then we'll sum up with some conclusions. So why using neuroimaging in dementia? Because dementia is primarily a clinical diagnosis, and the EFNS guidelines clearly state that neuroimaging should be performed at least once during the workup of a memory clinic patients. Um, in uh, the first view, it's very important to uh, rule out possible treatable causes of dementia, such as tumors, inflammations, or post-traumatic abnormalities. But these findings can only be observed in the minority of patients, approximately 3 to 6 percent. In the most part, uh, on, on the mon uh, majority of the patients, we are looking for a specific pathology, uh, and particularly for certain atrophy patterns, vascular pathology, and of course uh, comorbidity to support the clinical diagnosis of uh, dementia. So therefore we are dealing from a sort of uh, shift from the sort of action, uh, exclusionary approach to the inclusionary approach. And this is an example of the exclusionary approach to rule out uh, possible treatable causes of dementia like subtural hematomas or extra, extra axial tumors like seen here in the right frontal lobe. But more often, we are dealing with the so-called inclusionary approach by observing a certain atrophy pattern like here in the medial temporal lobe on the right side and the global cortical atrophy and the atrophy of the posterior part of the brain like in AD patients and, of course, vascular pathology like lacunes and large vessel disease in vascular dementia patients. Uh, beyond this, we can also uh, try to monitor disease progression and also monitor treatment of dementia. Uh, this is a patient um, coming to us um, at baseline with mild cognitive uh, impairment, and you see very nicely that during follow-up, the atrophy, so the neurodegenerative changes are become more prominent, particularly here in the, in the medial temporal lobe, but also in the global cortex and uh, this is becoming more evident in later follow-up. You see here a very nice uh, overview of the uh, atrophy of the medial temporal lobe, particularly on the right side, and you see also a more pronounced global cortical atrophy. We are uh, moving from the question of why to use um, uh, neuroimaging in dementia to how to use uh, neuroimaging in dementia. Of course, MR is, is the modality of choice, and it's, uh, it's very cheap in terms of um, uh, not using a contrast because uh, the contrast is not necessary in dementia patients. Only a, a minority of patients presenting with tumors need uh, contrast media, but the majority of patients do not need contrast media. Uh, a workhorse is the oblique coronal T1-weighted image, which is very important to evaluate the medial temporal lobe, particularly the hippocampus. The axial flare and the axial T2 weighted images are very important to uh, detect the vascular pathology. Uh, the conventionally T2 weighted image is still very necessary in terms of detecting our pathology in the basal ganglia and particularly in the thalamus. And the axial T2 star gradient echo or the uh, SWI images are very important uh, for the detection of microbleeds and superficial xylerosis. And the DWI is very important to detect comorbidities so, such as inflammatory findings in prion disease. And optionally, you can use uh, other uh, methods like uh, atrospin labeling or resting state MRI. CT is coming back. Um, we need CT, particularly in those patients not able to undergo MR, like claustrophobic patients, but also pay, uh, um, pacemaker patients. We have established our CT protocol in Amsterdam based on the 64 multi detector row CT, but you can easily use it for any other um, uh, vendor and any, any other um, um, uh, CT system. But it's very important to make the multi-planar uh, reconstructions according to the reconstructions you made 
for the MR. And you can see very nicely if you perform the oblique coronal MPR on the CT, which is comparable to the T1, you can very nicely evaluate the medial temporal lobe also on the CT image. In terms of uh, image analysis, um, it's very important to make a very standardized and structurized image analysis, and most of the image, image analysis is focusing, of course, on atrophy, uh, particularly uh, global atrophy, but also focal atrophy. Uh, this is very important uh, dealing with the posterior parts of the brain. I will focus on that later on. The medial temporal lobe is very important, in particular the hippocampus, and uh, vascular lesions are very important. So the image analysis goes beyond the assessment of atrophy. Vascular lesions include the subcortical white matter hypertensities, uh, like seen in small vessel disease, the proventricle uh, caps and bands. Uh, thalamus infarctions are very, very important, particularly lacunar infarctions in the thalamus. Uh, lacunar infarctions and the deep white matter are very important and are also included in the vascular dementia criteria and large vessel diseases are very important, particularly in the dominant hemisphere. So this is an um, overview of the rating scale we use for the global cortical atrophy, a very rough scale, but a very, uh, very good scale and corresponds well to uh, Volumetric um, measurements, grade zero is no atrophy, grade one only a widening of the salsi, grade two you're dealing with a volume loss or starting a volume loss of the gyri, and grade three you see the night blade pattern, particularly here in the posterior lobes. Um, we have also rating scales are uh, dealing with certain parts of the brain, like the posterior part of the brain. Uh, we call it posterior cortical atrophy, and these atrophy patterns are uh, very frequently seen in early onset dementias, but also in DLB patients. And these uh, atrophy uh, scores are dealing with the posterior cingulate and the precuneus. Moving to the uh, MTA, uh, you know that the hippocampus is very crucial in terms of uh, memory uh, decline. Uh, we use the so-called uh, Schelten's uh, scale uh, dealing with three uh, relevant anatomic landmarks, the width of the choroid fissure, the width of the temporal horn, and the volume and of the hippocampus. And depending on the width of the temporal horn and the choroid fissure and the volume of the hippocampus, we're dealing with a score from zero to end stage atrophy score four. And this is a nice overview of the different stages of the uh, medial temporal load atrophy. Here on the left side, grade zero, uh, stage one, uh, uh, slightly wider um, aspect of the choroid fissure, and grade two, already a slight volume loss of the hippocampus, and grade three and grade four, the volume loss of the hippocampus uh, gets more pronounced. Moving to the vascular pathology, uh, the subcortical white matter hyperintensities can be easily rated according to the Faseca score, a uh, fourth point uh, scale reaching from zero to three, zero no lesions, uh, grade one punctiform lesions, grade two uh, early confluent lesions, and grade three confluent lesions, and you can also perform this for the periventricle caps and bands. And this is an example of the different um, uh, grades of vascular pathology. So grade zero, uh, grade one, the punctiform uh, lesions, which you can easily be seen here on the flare images. We have difficulties uh, finding these lesions on the CT images, but the more clinically relevant lesions, so the starting confluent lesions here on the MR images can be easily appreciated also on the CT, and particularly the uh, pathological uh, confluent lesions here on the MR can also be assess on the CT. In other words, the clinical relevant uh, pathology on the MR can also be easily assessed on CT. Cerebral microbleeds are very important uh, since they can um, deal with rather specific pathology. We're dealing with different types of cerebral microbleeds, so the lobar microbleeds and the so-called superficial zeteroses, which, which are hemosiderine uh, depositions in the uh, space. 
And these uh, types of microbleeds are rather associated with the cerebral amyloid angiopathy, and CAA is also related to AD pathology. And there's a, another type of microbleeds, the so-called non-lobar microbleeds, located more in central regions of the brain, particularly in the basal ganglia and the thalamus. And these lesions, these microbleeds, these non-lobar microbleeds, are more associated with small vessel disease. So dealing with a wide uh, heterogeneous uh, spectrum of um, diseases associated with dementia, it's very important to know about certain atrophy patterns and certain um, imaging patterns which can guide you through these very confusing uh, spectrum of diseases. And a very typical pattern we can observe is uh, in Alzheimer's disease. You know that Alzheimer's disease is the most prevalent type of dementia. It can be clinically rather heterogeneous. And on pathology, we, we see these, these massive loss of volume, the cortical atrophy. And these findings can also be appreciated, easily appreciated on the uh, MR and NCT. You see these global cortical atrophy particularly in the posterior part of the brain. You see the atrophy of the medial trempel lobe. You see the atrophy in the precunus and posterior cingulate, and you can see the lobar microbleeds. Compared to the classical late-onset Alzheimer's disease, we are sometimes also dealing with early-onset uh, Alzheimer patients, so very young Alzheimer patients. And these patients sometimes have a completely different uh, pattern uh, in terms of atrophy, these patients have more uh, pronounced atrophy of the posterior part of the brain and not a global cortical atrophy, and the medial temporal lobe is relatively spared. So this posterior cortical atrophy is a very distinctive pattern can, which can be observed in all early onset Alzheimer's disease. Sometimes, uh, particularly in, in patients with mild cognitive uh, uh, impairment, um, but suspicious of Alzheimer pathology, we do not see any atrophy of any other comorbidities. Like in this patient, we don't see any uh, global cortical atrophy. We see a, a couple of white matter hyperintensities, no atrophy uh, of the precuneus and the posterior cingulate, no atrophy of the medial temporal lobe. And there, uh, new modalities like atrial spin labeling can help us to um, identify uh, pathology in these patients. This is the ASL uh, image. We place a region of interest here in the posterior cingulate. And we can find in this patient an uh, impaired perfusion in the posterior cingulate. Moving to other um, uh, imaging uh, uh, methods like FTG PET. Uh, this uh, impaired perfusion seen here in the posterior cingulate can be validated by a, an, a decreased uh, metabolism here in the pos uh, posterior cingulate and in the precunus. And in fact, uh, looking at the PIB PET, we see that this patient has a amyloid tracer binding, and this is very suggestive of Alzheimer's pathology. In other words, Perfusion imaging can help us to identify uh, uh, abnormalities in patients suspicious of Alzheimer pathology while the structural MRI is rather normal. Another disease is FTD, frontal temporal dementia, includes a very heterogeneous group of patients, uh, including the behavioral variant of FTD with frontal and temporal atrophy, uh, asymmetric atrophy can be observed in uh, semantic dementia patients and progressive uh, phaser patients, particularly in the left temporal lobe. And there's also another variant dealing with the atrophy of the right temporal lobe, uh, uh, named right temporal variant of FTD. This is an example of an MR uh, of MR findings of uh, patients with a behavioral variant of FTD. You can very nicely see the pronounced atrophy of both uh, frontal lobes, particularly here in the mesofrontal lobe and here in the basal uh, frontal areas, while the me uh, medial temporal lobe is relatively spared. DLB is another example that structural imaging can, has, uh, 
can have uh, limitations. Uh, DLB patients show up with a rather unspecific pattern, a little bit of global cortical atrophy, a little bit of vascular comorbidity. The um, MTA, so the hippocampal atrophy, is rather mild. And in these patients, we once again need additional neuroimaging uh, findings, new methods like FTG PET uh, demonstrating the singlet eyelet sign or a SPECT uh, examination focusing on the uh, dopamine magic uh, pathways. And I think uh, Horst Ober will focus on these imaging techniques later on. Atrophy pattern is not exclusively uh, prominent in the supratentorial uh, super brain. It can also be very prominent in the infratentorial brain, like in PSP patients, we see an atrophy of the mesencephalon, and compared to normal controls, we see a slight uh, different shape of the, um, uh, of the mesencephalon, which can be compared to the hummingbird, which has coined the term hummingbird sign. This is another example of a PSP, once again, the sort of Mickey Mouse appearance of the mesencephalon, once again, the hummingbird appearance of the, um, of the mesencephalon. And if you have doubts, you can once again try to use FTG PET and try to offend, uh, identify the hypometabolism in the mesencephalon. One final slide uh, dealing with vascular dementia. Um, vascular dementia uh, is also a very uh, heterogeneous disease in terms of imaging findings. Uh, we have to differentiate between a small vessel disease and a large vessel disease. A large vessel disease um, affects or has to affect the dominant hem uh, hemisphere, and it's clearly defined, the uh, so vascular dimension is clearly defined by having a cognitive uh, um, impairment in combination with vascular changes on MR, and there has to be a temporal relationship between these two findings. To sum up, uh, neuroimaging is very useful and it's crucial in, in memory clinic patients not only to exclude possible treatable causes of dementia but also in terms of supporting the clinical diagnosis. Uh, neuroimaging uh, findings can be very heterogeneous as I showed you. We see a lot of neurodegenerative changes but also we see a lot of uh, vascular changes, a lot of vascular pathology. There are also many, many diseases, neuroinflammatory disease, but also um, neoplastic diseases, which can uh, present as uh, uh, dementia. And neuroimaging can be very sensitive and very specific, particularly when performing advanced MR and PET. And uh, this is uh, particularly the case in detection of Alzheimer pathology, like using um, PET uh, amyloid tracer. Uh, once again, I would like to uh, draw your attention on this very nice book, which has been written by many members of our department in collaboration with the Queen Square. And I would like to acknowledge my teachers and mentors, uh, Frederick Barkov, Nick Fox, and Philip Sch Scheltens. And I would like to thank you for your attention. Thank you much.